Welcome to today's special and first ever multi-network and multimedia live feed broadcast of this, our election 2016 candidate forums for Louisiana. I'm John Redmond, your host and as part of a historic first Cox Network's show De Todo Un Poco with moderator and co-host Julio Guichard, Julio Guichard and WLAE New Orleans Public Television show John Redmond, Power of Attorney. We have partnered together to present the first and only Latino-focused debate of the 2016 elections. We've also partnered with our very own local Latino television and radio network, KGLA, in this effort. And last but not least, we've partnered with many news organizations, including and almost all of the well-known Latino-focused news organizations who are not only covering this event, but are live streaming it to their online followers on Facebook. Many other or online organizations are live streaming this to the Latino communities across the great state of Louisiana, too. And we thank them for their participation in this important election. ¿Qué tal, amigos? Yo soy Julio Guichar, animador y productor del programa de Todo un Poco. Y estoy orgulloso de ser parte de este programa en donde nos unimos a otra cadena para poder presentarles a la comunidad hispana los candidatos de la Corte de Delitos, la Corte de la Apelación y más importante para la gran población de hispanos que viven en Kenner, también vamos a tener a los candidatos que van a optar por la alcaldía de Kenner. Esperamos que esto sea una de muchas veces en que podamos participar en este tipo de colaboración y que todo sea para que podamos como comunidad hispana involucrarnos más y más, educarnos más y más para que podamos tener una voz en nuestro estado. Falta una semana para las elecciones. In many ways, the Hispanic vote can be considered the swing vote in citywide and statewide elections. For example, in Kenner, Louisiana, Hispanics make up nearly a quarter of the population. But even so, the political system often neglects this large segment of our population and community. Sabemos que la población hispana puede ser muy influyente en las elecciones y esperamos que hoy en día los candidatos les puedan brindar información acerca de ellos y sus ideas para ayudar a la comunidad, que los ayuden a tomar su decisión el día 8 de noviembre. The forums covered in this show will include the Criminal District Court in New Orleans, the Louisiana Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals race, and the Kenner Mayor's race. So coming up next, we begin our forum with the candidates for Criminal District Court. Stay tuned. There's nothing Americans love more than posting online who you should vote for. You tweet and you snap and you gawk, but if you don't show up and vote, it's all just talk. Take a little time on November 8th to do your civic duty and renew your faith in the nation you want. Let them know the truth. The room where it happens is the voting booth. So, vote, vote, America, vote, vote. The time is now. Welcome back to the show. On November 8th, we will have the election for many candidates, including to elect the new judge for Section D of Orleans Criminal District Court. The candidates are Judge Paul Bonin and attorneys Kevin Guillory and Dennis Moore. Thank you all for being with us here today. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, well, let's get right to it. Time is short. So um, the first question, and by random allotment, we have Mr. Kevin Guillory gets to uh, answer it first. You have two minutes to give us your name, your, a summary of your campaign platform, and three of your best qualities that you think qualify you for this very important seat at Criminal District Court. Well, my name's Kevin Guillory. I'm going to be number 77 on your ballot. Um, I currently work as a prosecutor at the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office, where I've been primarily handling uh, major offenses such as homicides, aggravated rapes, and aggravated kidnappings for about the past uh, seven, eight years. Um, I've also worked as a defense attorney a little bit in, uh, for a couple of years in private practice. Um, what I'd like to do once I'm elected is, first of all, I'd like to spearhead a change in the criminal justice system, um, working with the community, working with the other judges and lobbying, um, 
with this to the city and to the legislature so we can really bring positive change to the criminal justice system. Um, and I'm talking about trying to fight against mandatory minimum sentences, trying to limit the ways or create uh, additional criteria that the district attorney and the courts must at, must look at when um, utilizing the multiple bill. Um, I'd like to further implement avail already available uh, programs in court such as reentry court, drug court, mental health court, veterans court. Um, and most importantly, I want to make sure that we're putting rehabilitation back in the criminal justice system. It seems like for far too long, uh, the system is more focused on punishment and there needs to be a, a rehabilitation in the system so that we can prevent uh, young men and women who come through the system from coming back through the system. And we have to do that out in the community by, by getting them treatment for whatever um, issues they are facing, such as mental health, drug addiction, um, lack of community resources, lack of family resources, and most importantly, lack of jobs. Um, and finally, I'd like to work with the businesses in the city and other departments so that we can task employers in our city to give these young men and women, particularly those who are on probation or returning from incarceration, opportunities and jobs to prevent them from coming through the system. Okay. Spearhead change, uh, incorporate more rehabilitation into the system instead of punishment, and use your skills from your experience to bring about uh, a partnership with the community. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next on the list is uh, Mr. Moore, Dennis Moore. Um, same question for you, and I'll repeat it. Um, your name, your platform, and three of your best qualities that you think qualify you for this important post serving the community as a criminal court judge in Orleans Parish. Okay. My name is Dennis Moore. My number is number 78 on the ballot. Um, I've actually been a criminal uh, defense attorney for about 18 years, working in all over the state, but primarily here in Orleans Parish. What my platform is very simple. I believe that we need to put justice back into the system. It's easy to say justice, but this is how I plan on doing it. First thing, that the criminal justice system need to be modernized. It makes no sense that we have a criminal justice system that uh, is still based on 20th century technology. When you have other courts in this state that are using 21st century technology to streamline the process. The second thing that I believe that we need to do is, when I say put justice back into the criminal justice system, we need to look at having both victims who have to go through the system and defendants feel that they are getting adequate justice in the system instead of uh, the platitudes that people may say. How is that? There makes no sense that a case, a simple case such as a possession of cocaine, should last take over a year for the people to get uh, to court. Another thing we need to deal with is the over-incarceration of uh, people for nonviolent crimes. And that means that from the bail bonding system as far as setting excessively high bonds, we need to actually deal with that. A person is considered innocent until they go through the entire process. Uh, right now, we actually use the bonding system to actually keep people in jail until they can actually go through the system, which we already know is flawed. What makes me the person that is more capable is going to, I'm looking at my background, and I'll discuss that uh, more in depth a little later on. Okay, so um, modernize a justice system that is overdue for technology and other improvements uh, to catch up with technology and other modern improvements that are that are being used by other systems. Uh, put the justice back in the justice system where uh, nonviolent criminals are crowding an overcrowded system, if I'm hearing you right, uh, and um, uh, otherwise look to improve the system in other ways that you've witnessed as somebody working in the system as a defense attorney. Basically using technology, yes, sir. Okay, all right. All right, um, Paul Bonin, uh, judge in the Fourth Circuit, uh, same question goes to you. Uh, two minutes, your name so people can hear you say it, platform that you're running on, uh, or the main points of your platform, and uh, three of your best qualities that you think qualify you to assume that very important position in criminal district court. Oh, thank you very much, John, for having us here this afternoon. Uh, the first thing, my name is Paul Bonin. I am number 76, or uh, 76, I hope I said that 
uh, with my limited Spanish. Um, I am serving, as you mentioned, as a judge currently on the Court of Appeal, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal. Previous to my serving on that court, I was a traffic court in Orleans Parish for 11 years. The last eight years I've been on the Court of Appeal, which oversees, among other courts, the Criminal District Court, which I am now seeking to serve uh, as a judge. The kind of two hallmarks that I feel a judge should have, and I think I bring special experiences and qualities to, is a judge in criminal court especially should be respectful of everyone who comes in there, respectful of their human dignity. Uh, that could be the defendant, that can be the victim, that can be the juror, the court watcher, the police officer, or a witness. That's one side. The other aspect that the judge has to be, especially in criminal court, is completely committed, totally committed to the Bill of Rights. That is, in the, when you cut through everything else, that no one is to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And the key thing there is a fair trial. And a fair trial involves assistance of counsel. A fair trial means not being held in detention or in jail unnecessarily, but you have those sorts of rights, and myriad other ones. Now, what I think the qualities that I bring, or I have demonstrated over my 20 years as a judge, that I care, number two, that I am a student of the law, and three, that I have a wealth of experience. Okay. So to try and get the high points of that, you, uh, you want to respect everybody's rights, no matter what your role in the courtroom is, as a victim, as a criminal defendant, as a, somebody sitting in the jury, a police officer, a witness in a case, a prosecutor, or defense counsel. Um, you're committed to the Bill of Rights. You want to respect the Constitution and the rights that it promises everybody, whether or not you're accused or you're a victim uh, or you're a police officer trying to do his job. Um, and you want to make sure everybody gets a fair trial and that their rights uh, to a fair trial are upheld, if I, if I understood you. Is that a fair restatement? That's very fair. Okay, good. Moving right along. Um, uh, and so we don't do it in the same order every time. Um, I'm going to ask uh, you, Mr. Moore, to uh, start the next question. What are the most pressing issues facing Latinos and other minorities in our criminal justice system, uh, in your opinion, uh, things like uh, getting a, uh, get, obtaining fairness, fairness to all, and assuring that in our world, discussed in politics a lot lately, uh, assuring Latinos not to fear our legal justice system as victims, as witnesses to crime, and other matters you want to touch on, and you get a whole two minutes <laughs> to try and answer that. Yeah, well, one of the main things that is affecting the Latino and other minorities, the main thing is that they are afraid of the system. They don't understand the system. A lot of that is because we as judges or the system doesn't go out and say, hey, these are your rights that you have. What needs to be done in the criminal district court in that realm, I believe that the court needs to set up where it's more friendly to all our citizens. That means that we need to bring in interpreters to be able to come through and help um, many uh, Latinos who may not, English may not be their first language. So they need to understand what's going on. You need to have uh, interpreters not only in the court, but when you have dealing with different attorneys that are representing them, so uh, that they are explained, or they're explaining their rights and what they can and cannot do, what the government can and cannot do, and not put in a situation that they are afraid, if they're victims, they're afraid to come in, because uh, people may tell them things that are, are not true, uh, especially when we deal with some undocumented, they're just like, well, I'm not going down there because I'm going to end up getting uh, kicked out of the country. Uh, but they are victims, so they are actually are being, again, victimized by the system. So the, our criminal justice system needs to open up to, to bring in different professionals who actually have that uh, expertise to actually explain all our documents, all our motion hearings and stuff should be written in different uh, languages, in Spanish, in French. So uh, 
anybody that comes in can actually understand what's going on. That's the main thing that needs to be done. And me as a judge in my court, I would actually make sure that we have all that information uh, there for the victims and defendants also. Okay. So you want to make sure that anybody out there, whether you're a victim of a crime or you are an accused in a crime or um, you're involved in the system, that um, there's a way for them to have their rights explained to them, uh, they're educated about their rights, and so they won't fear the system as much as long as they understand the system better. That's true. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, going down the line, uh, uh, Paul, what, what about well, you? I very much agree with Dennis about interpreters. Um, the biggest single problem I think that we've had with interpreters in the courts is that they're not all, they have not always been professional interpreters, and that means that they either weren't properly trained. It's not adequate to have someone who only speaks the language to be the interpreter. They have to have some training in legal terminology and some ability to clearly communicate these very, very difficult legal principles to people. And so in that respect, I think that the challenge of the court and the responsibility that the judge has to take for ensuring, as again, a part of a fair trial, fair proceedings, take responsibility to make sure that we have professional interpreters in the court. The second aspect that I think is a big challenge um, to Latinos and Latinas that are coming into the court is that sometimes uh, they are disconnected from some of the usual places that we're familiar with, the judges and the attorneys and so forth. So it looks like that they have a higher hurdle when it comes to asking for pretrial release. Well, who do you who do you know, you see? And they're, they're not necessarily connected to people that, that we know. So we need to be able, and I think Dennis pointed this out quite properly, we as judges need to be going out into the community and familiarizing ourselves with the places where the Latinos and the Latinos have made their homes and have made connections in the community so that those leaders can come to the court and speak for Latinos and vouch for them and let us know that we have a, a somebody who can be relied upon. Okay, so educating uh, people uh, through access into the community, through the leaders in the Hispanic community, and when they're in the courtroom, making sure that interpreters are there and properly trained. Except the only little thing is educating us, the judges. Right. In other words, not necessarily us going to the community and telling them something, but them letting us know. Letting the court listen right. to the Hispanic uh, right. community and the leaders in the community. Thank you for that. <coughs> All right, um, Kevin Guillory. Well, first off, I agree with both uh, Judge Bone and Mr. Moore as far as um, the translators. Um, I do believe we need to have professional translators at every point of the proceedings, um, not just when they come to court, because by the time they actually come to one of the felony sections of court, that means that the charges have already been accepted against them, or if they're a victim, it means that they're at some point where they're going to have to testify in the near future, um, or just to be interested. So we need to not only have uh, translators on hand, um, we need to have translators available for people, um, Latino people who are arrested and accused from the moment of arrest. So once they're making their initial appearances to have their bond set. Um, and that's something that the judges and the, the criminal justice system, whether it's the sheriff's office, should make sure they implement into that system. Additionally, I believe we need to have appropriate signage in the criminal district courthouse. Um, that's also um, in languages that the Latino community would understand. We need to have an information center in the courtroom. Uh, I know I don't know if I've heard that, but that's one of the things I've talked about is that a lot of times people come in the, come in the court and they'd have no idea where to go. They come up and catch a, the nearest attorney that they see and say, where do I go to get this? And I can only imagine what, how difficult that would be for someone from the Latino community trying to find uh, where they're supposed to be if they're talking to a bunch of people in the hallway that don't even speak their language. So we need to make sure there's appropriate services, such uh, translation services for all of the people and the community when it comes to going to court. I agree with Judge Bonin also about going into community. And I think what we need to do is the judges need to not only be educated but also do need to educate the Latino community about their rights and about the criminal justice system. I can tell you, my work as a prosecutor, I have seen 
that the Latino community, while it is ever growing and getting larger and larger, they are continuously being victimized and being victims of crime because p those who are offenders believe that one, they won't report it because they think the majority of them are undocumented. And then additionally, they believe that they won't come, um, that they won't have interest and that they also have cash on because they don't have bank accounts. We've got to educate them and let them know that it is safe to participate in the process. It is safe to testify. It is safe to come to court. You will not be deported. You will not be treated unfairly because you are from Latino descent. Okay. So you've agreed a lot with uh, what we've already heard from the other candidates. Um, the uh, access to a, a quality trained interpreters reaching out to the community and, yes. and you've added that uh, even the way signs are done in the courthouse, you need it for both English speakers and um, Spanish speakers mm -hmm. uh, and just basically having intelligent decisions on how the Hispanic community is educated not to fear the system. Okay, so we're down to our last question. Uh, it's going to be short, time is short, so in one minute I want you to Tell us what you'd like the viewers to know about you, in very briefly, one minute, uh, in considering who to vote, or Hispanic voters. Well, I'd like you voters to know that I have been a judge for 20 years and have tried to be an innovative judge in all of those 20 years. But I really want to say to your viewers and is that the judge in a criminal court can be the most important person in their lives, and that when they go to vote on November the 8th, not to forget to go down the ballot and to vote on all of the positions that are there. I am Judge Paul Bonin. I am number C-86, and I would appreciate consideration. Thank you. All right, now we're going to Mr. Uh, Guillory. What I'd like your viewers to know is that I truly appreciate the contribution that they've made to our city. And I know that a lot of times they do feel like outsiders, um, not only just in the criminal justice system, but also in the city period. And I can tell you that after Katrina, I know firsthand that half of this city was rebuilt on the backs and the sweat and the labor of the Hispanic community. So thank you for contributing to our city. And I just want to ask you that if you consider voting for me, I will make sure that you feel welcome, that you always feel welcome and appreciated in my courtroom. You will not feel like an outsider. You will be treated with the same respect, and I will observe the same constitutional rights that any other citizen of this country or any other human being has been given and deserves. So please vote for Kevin Guillory, number 77. Okay. Uh, next, Mr. Dennis Moore. Uh, first, I want to thank you for allowing me to come in and speak to uh, the uh, Hispanic community and the community at large. My name is Dennis Moore. I'm number 78 on the ballot. I believe that in this race, you're looking for a, a person who will be an innovator. I believe I am that innovator. I have a master's in software design that I can bring the technology and the improvement that way. I also look at that I've been a criminal defense attorney for 18 years actually fighting for individuals in this criminal justice system. I know where their problems are. I know where it needs to be done to fix it. Please vote for Dennis Moore, number 78. Thank you. Well, thank you, all three of you. Um, uh, at this point, we're going to have to end the discussion. Coming up next, we'll be speaking to candidates for the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal. And uh, we have to conclude it here. Thank you much, yeah, and good luck you, to all Jeff. of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll shake your hand in a minute, Judge right. Burns. elections on the brain you want a revolution i want a revelation so how you gonna change the nation we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and when you vote for president you get to pick who participates in the sequel what Welcome back. On Tuesday, November 8th, today's guests will face off in an election to serve on the bench of Louisiana's Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal. Joining us, us is Chief Judge Lori White of Criminal District Court in New Orleans and Judge Regina Bartholomew Woods of Civil District Court in New Orleans. Welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. So let's get right to it. We're having a forum. Uh, one of you is going to win this race. There won't be a runoff because it's just the two of you on the ballot. Um, Let's start off with our first question. 
Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Judge Bartholomew Woods. Tell us, uh, tell the viewers, what is your name? What is your platform uh, in a nutshell? Well, my name is Regina Bartholomew Woods. I am a judge at Civil Court, and my platform is simple. I just believe that judges should have an even-killed and great judicial temperament. They should work just as hard as the people who have elected to serve, um, who they've elected, uh, who've been elected by the people, um, and they should have a deep and broad background. And I believe that I possess all of those qualities and uh, have shown that since I've been on the bench at Civil District Court have shown that throughout my work as a lawyer uh, for public service as well as in private service and believe that those skills will transfer very easily to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal is 100 percent a reading and writing court. Seventy-five percent of what we do at Civil District Court is reading and writing and so those skills will just transfer very easily to the Court of Appeal. Okay, so to make sure I want to sum up um, your background, your, your experience being on the on the Civil District Court in New Orleans uh, translates nicely to the work that would be expected of you in the Court of Appeal because of so much legal paperwork that you have to review uh, and the opinions that you would write on the Court of Correct. Appeal and your commitment to the community and service you believe is it's, uh, it's kind of a promotion to go from where you are to the Court of Appeal. Absolutely, as well as my judicial temperament. Oh yeah, you've mentioned that too. Thank you for <laughs> adding that. Um, Judge Lori White, same question. Your name and your platform in a nutshell. Thank you. I'm Judge Lori White. I'm the Chief Judge over at Criminal District Court. I've been a judge for nine years over at Criminal District Court, and during that time, I've tried over 145 jury trials and over 60 something judge trials. I've been a lawyer for 30 years, and my experience is much broader than my opponent. I bring to the Court of Appeal not only criminal knowledge for which my opponent has never had a single jury trial as a lawyer or as a judge, but I also have civil law experience. And the important thing is the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal has 65 percent of their filings are criminal in nature. There are 12 judges at that court and only one of those judges has ever had a, uh, has come from criminal district court. So the fact that you have two different uh, platforms, civil and criminal judges, that are going to that court, it's important to have some parity with expertise from the criminal side. Just to get back to you on that, you, uh, I mean, just to sum up, um, you have a lot of trial experience uh, presiding as the judge over 140 uh, jury trials, 60-something uh, trials where there's no jury, but you're the judge and you're making the decision. Um, the experience in the criminal world, uh, you, you say, is going to uh, serve you well when you're reviewing decisions that go up to the Court of Appeal, and the other judges on the Court of Appeal, um, there's an absence or a, a, a scarcity of uh, criminal court experience in the Court of Appeal. Correct. Right? Okay. All right. Uh, next question, because we're tight on time, and uh, it's not a debate, it's a forum. Um, uh, I want to ask you, how. what do you believe about uh, minorities, including Latinos, and their access to uh, fair and f access to justice and equal justice in our court system. Um, uh, Judge White, I'm going to point this to you. Uh, and if if you believe there's a concern there about fair uh, justice and equal access to justice, uh, what do you think can be done about this uh, from the from the view of Court of Appeal? Well, specifically, the Court of Appeal is where if someone is convicted, that would be the last court if they cannot afford a lawyer, that they would get a free lawyer to take them to that court. So a Court of Appeal needs to have an expert that's looking at that record because many um, minorities and others can't afford lawyers to go to that court. So you need to make sure that their last opportunity to have a case looked at is looked at very closely. You also need to make sure that that conviction, if it was a good conviction, or a, a civil judgment um, contrary to what they are asking for, is looked at carefully. Because if not, it could affect uh, immigration status, and it has so many different collateral issues. I've started a reentry program that has taken in um, consideration minorities so that they can get a job after a conviction. So that's what I've been doing in the community for the nine years that I've also been a judge. Okay. 
Same question for you, Judge Bartholomew, Bartholomew White. The, uh, what? The, uh, do you want me to repeat the question? No, I no, think you got I got it. it. Thank right. you. And I'm Bartholomew Woods. Bartholomew Woods. That's fine. I apologize. One of the biggest challenges that I've discovered since uh, being a judge is the access to justice in terms of proper translation. There are a lot of citizens who reside within our city who uh, have English as a second language and not as their primary language. And so one of the things that I think we need to pay attention to as appellate court judges, making sure that a translator was provided to the defendant, to the plaintiff, because it's not only criminal matters at the appellate court, but there's family law matters, there's juvenile law matters, there's civil law matters, that a court of appeal has to understand what's going on. And in order to make sure that justice was equal and access to justice was provided to a citizen where English is a second language, we must make sure that the trial judge correctly appointed a translator, not only just Spanish, but with a certain diction if that person had a particular diction. And whether that's Spanish, whether it's African, whether it's Ethiopian, whatever the language may be, that they have provided, been provided with that translator so that they fully understand and comprehend the process that they've gone through and make sure that there has not been a denial of access to justice at the very basic fundamental level of even comprehension or understanding what was being said in our native tongue, which may not have been that person's native tongue. Okay, so um, access to fair and equal justice uh, includes making sure that at uh, the lower court level when you're reviewing those opinions, making sure that those people who uh, don't have English as their first Absolutely. language were able to communicate well with uh, their lawyer, the court, during the trial Absolutely. to get uh, what do they call it, a fair, an effective assistance to counsel and being able to be understood properly with an interpreter who actually Absolutely. speaks their native tongue and their proper native tongue, Honduran Absolutely. versus Cuban, for instance. Correct. Okay. All right. Last question. Um, what can you say to the population of Hispanic or Latino or Latina women voters about uh, the reasons why uh, they should look up to you uh, as opposed to your opponent uh, or just the fact that it's a woman on the ballot as opposed to three or four men on the ballot and uh, why they should vote and what that means to them uh, to understand the importance of voting and the effect of just seeing a woman on the ballot, a minority woman on the ballot. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you to answer that. Well, I think I asked you to start, right? Yes. As a minority woman, I think that based upon my own family's heritage, my mother and father who are from a housing project, who came from just the depths of being poor. Um, and not even having the ability to vote, let alone to be placed on a ballot when they were young, and opening those doors for people who look like me, not, o not only women, but minority women. I think it's vitally important that we set a great example for women and minority women who decide one day to be a part of the political process. You have to have a certain cultural competence in addition to having all of the skill in the world, in addition to having all of the book knowledge in the world, and you can't leave that at the door. I cannot leave the fact that I am African American and that I am female at any courthouse door. It comes with me and it presides in me when I'm looking at something. I'm looking at it through the eyes of a minority, through the eyes of a female. And it makes it just much more sensitive to issues that may come across that may become blind to a man to a majority man or to any man for that fact. And I think that it's just vitally important when we have to review domestic violence cases that may get appealed, when we have to review family law cases, when we have to review juvenile law cases, when we have to review civil disputes, and when we have to review criminal disputes, that being culturally competent is vitally important to the decisions that we make every day as a judge. And as long as I continue to serve with integrity, with judicial temperament, then I'm setting the example for other minority women to look up to. I'm going to try and sum that up. Your experience uh, growing up in a household uh, dealing with uh, uh, socioeconomic struggles, uh, your parents had difficulty uh, being permitted to vote, uh, uh, being familiar and connected with your cultural experiences as an African American, as a female, these are, these are experiences that you take and you use to your benefit in, uh, in carrying out your job as a judge. 
uh, uh, carrying out your job with integrity, I believe is the word you used, and these are strengths you take with you on the Court of Appeals? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Judge White, um, same question for you. Thank you. I've never obtained anything easily. Nothing's ever come to me easily. I had to go to public schools. My parents were um, farmers. I grew up trying to make a living as the first one in my family to graduate from college. I went to Southern Law School as a minority, and I went there because I could afford to go to Southern Law School. After graduating from Southern, I wanted to always be a prosecutor, and, and I thought that was the best way to help people. Then I realized being a criminal defense lawyer and being um, an attorney, and I've always run my own business for almost uh, 20 years. I had my own law firm. I learned how to help uh, so many uh, minority women who came to me for a divorce because their child was in trouble or because their children had a drug problem. And that's what I've done for the last 30 years as a lawyer. I've worked with people that never forgotten uh, where I've come from and where these people need help. I've been able to help people whether they had money or no money. And that's what it's been about as a lawyer and as a woman uh, sharing the same concerns for our children, our future, our safety, uh, the safety of women that have issues in the community and trying to support their children. So my experience and my history in this community for which I have helped um, countless families, I've started a program in our community which continues to give back to the community by returning people with skills to the community to work. Um, my history shows that as a woman, I've been giving back and this hasn't been just about me attaining and not uh, returning. To try and hit the high notes, yeah, you, you came from uh, financial um, difficulties, you worked hard for all the things you've uh, obtained, uh, you accomplished uh, plenty obviously at becoming a judge, and you've given back to the community. You've taken cases and worked for free at times to try and give back many to the times. community. Many times. Okay. Well, now uh, we have time for uh, a, a final, basically, uh, wrap up. And, and so, starting with you, Judge White, um, in 60 seconds, uh, why don't you explain to the voters why you believe you are best suited? Uh, and you're addressing a very much Hispanic audience, although there's plenty of uh, Anglo or non Hispanics, why you believe you deserve their vote. Thank you. Because I care about people and because I spend time in the community and I've never seen um, color in what I've done and I've been able to stand against uh, political forces when political forces are willing to do things by over incarcerating our youth and our community. Because I care about people and make sure that justice prevails even when it's not a popular thing to do. Because I've helped people for free for 30 years when they needed help because it was the right thing to do because I have a heart and because I work hard at it and because I've never lost my sense of community and service and that's what I do as a lawyer and as a judge. Thank you. Judge uh, Bartholomew Woods. As a God-fearing woman, I understand that my role on this earth is limited by what God uses me for. I'm his instrument and I owe it all to him. And so what I mean by that is everything that I do has to have integrity. I have to have judicial temperament because I understand that I'm not the final authority on things. I understand clearly where all blessings come from and that's from God himself. And so I'm pleased to serve the citizens of New Orleans. I've served them with honor and with integrity. I'm pleased to have been endorsed by the Democratic Party and I'm pleased to carry that banner, the same banner that, ca that is carrying Hillary Clinton, the same banner that is carrying Congressman Cedric Richmond, and the same banner that carried U.S. Senator Mary Landrieu, both of whom have endorsed me. And I'm very proud of that because of what they stood for and stand for and because of what I stand for. And so I just hopefully ask for your voters um, vote number 70 on the ballot on November 8th. Well, thank you both for your time and thank stopping you. by. I know the Hispanic voters and others watching this show appreciate you taking the time to share your views, your experiences. That's all the time we have. It's been excellent uh, getting to know you a little bit better. Thank you. So thank you. coming up next, the candidates for mayor of Kenner, Louisiana will be here. We'll be right back.
Vente mi gente, vente mi gente. Es tiempo de escoger un presidente. Voten mi gente, voten mi gente. Alce la mano y diga presente. Vente mi gente, vente mi gente. No deje que este país no nos cuente. Voten mi gente, voten mi gente. El 8 de noviembre pa'l frente. Welcome back to the show. Kenner is Louisiana's sixth largest city. It has the largest Latino population in the state. Our guests today are among several on the ballot this November 8th, each asking to be elected mayor of Kenner. If nobody receives a majority of the votes, the top two candidates will have a runoff election on December 10th. All were invited to attend, but given the short notice, the only two candidates who were willing and able to join us for this forum, we have here today Maria DeFrances, Councilman DeFrances, Council Lady DeFrances, and Councilman Ben Zahn. So thank you both for being here. Thank, thank you, you for having us. All right, thank so you. let's get right to the questions. Now, the first question, let's start with Councilman uh, Zahn. Tell us who you are and why should the voters cast their vote for you, those in Kenner, for mayor of that great city? I'm on Jefferson Parish Council right now, which represents about 60% um, of the city of Kenner. Uh, I was on the Kenner Council before that. Over the last 11 years, uh, I've had elected office. Um, I think Kenner has a lot of vision and energy going on right now. We have a lot of things happening, corridor redevelopment, Lake Town expansion, Rivertown improvements. A lot of these things cost money. Of course, there's a 2030 plan in place that's going to take some care of some of that. But you also still need someone who has those relationships and I'm going to stick with the relationships that I have, to go back into those parish council chambers where we work with about $600 million, the parish council, as opposed to Kenner's $61 million budgets, and hopefully bring some of that money back home to help finance some of the things that we have going on. We're one of six cities within Jefferson Parish, and I think it's important that Kenner gets its fair share of what Jefferson Parish has to offer, too, and that's why I'm interested in running for mayor. Councilwoman DeFrances. You answer the same question. Why should the voters vote for you for mayor? First of all, when I ran for office in 2006, I had been a teacher for 30 years and five more as an administrator and the head start of the people of Jefferson Parish through the school system. But when I ran for office, I promised to be a full-time councilman and, and I would retire at that point. I retired. I have been a full-time councilman in a part-time position. I've been extremely active in economic development. When I, when I first took office, the mall was failing. We could have had East... Uh, like East New Orleans, we could have had Lake Force in, in Kenner and that mall could have failed. I'm talking about the Esplanade Mall. I worked very hard with then Mayor Munez to, and Jetco to bring the Target in. The second project was the theater. We needed both the Target and theater no, in order to save that mall. Uh, Ed Munez decided not to run for re-election. I continued to be on the council and sp spoke to Mr. Solomon directly over and over again, twice a week on the phone to make sure that the theater became a reality and it did. And those two entities helped save that mall. We now have a new company called Pacific uh, Realty Capital Partners. I've already spoken to the CEO. His name is Gary Carl. We have been working together already uh, via emails. And I'm working very hard not only to save the mall, but as councilwoman at large, I've also been active in economic development in other parts of the city, from Lake Town to the river. It's one city. We need to move every part of this city together forward for the good of the people of Kenner. Next question. Kenner has a large Latino population. Absolutely. By the 2010 census figures, it's knocking on 25%. It's about 24%. Um, how would you evaluate the relationship between the Hispanic or Latino community and the city of Kenner? And what plans uh, would you have or do you have to promote or grow and improve that relationship between the Hispanics or Latinos in Kenner and the city of Kenner, if you were given the privilege of serving as Kenner mayor? Well, first of all, I've been very, very active in the Latino community. We have the Hispanic Resource Center. I don't know if you, if you realize that the Hispanic Resource Center is the only such entity in the entire state of Louisiana. The city of Kenner actually, during June of 2003, opened that center. And it was actually uh, listed in the Congressional uh, Registry because we were unique uh, anywhere in the country and especially in Louisiana. And that center has been an absolute asset 
asset, excuse me, my voice is in back all the way, so I have to force it a little bit, for the Latino community. We provide citizenship uh, classes there. We provide computer tutorials. We provide English as a second language. We offer also uh, tutoring for our children there. We offer our police officers the ability to learn Spanish as, uh, at, at the Hispanic Resource Center. I've been very, very active with that center and will continue to be. And recently with one of our other councilmen, Councilman Reno, we have actually put money together to build a new building because that one is, is in decrepit condition. It's a little bit dangerous, in fact. But also with the rest of the community, I've been very, very involved with um, almost every event that the Latino community has in Jefferson Parish. I just went to Que Pasa recently at Lafreniere Park. We have, uh, at Herit in Heritage Park, we have we have uh, a different uh, or we have different groups that come in and have festivals there. I've been involved actively, and at Roosevelt Middle School, where I taught, I, I actually decided to learn English, uh, not just speak English, but speak Spanish, because I had a one third of the population was Hispanic, and so I went to uh, Costa Rica. Uh, I spent two months there, learned to speak Spanish, and I used it every day yeah, when I was there. Español. See, sí, see, sí, come in Okay. I mean, she speaks Spanish. Anything else? Um, again, we ha we, I've been involved with uh, all of the organizations there, and will continue to promote the, the Hispanic community, in Jeff in, not just in, in Kenner, but in Jefferson Parish and the rest of the area as well. I apologize if I interrupted That's you. That's okay. Okay, Councilman Zahn, same question for you. The population is, uh, there's a, it's the largest Hispanic population in the sixth most populous state in, Lu in Louisiana. What, uh, what do you make of the, how do you assess the relationship between the Hispanic population in Kenner and what plans would you have if given the privilege of serving as mayor in Kenner to promote and grow that uh, relationship? I was the District 3 Councilman for us on Parish Council, which actually where the Hispanic Resource Center is presently located. Whether they moving to a different location or expanding, that's what you know, Kenner government is looking at right now. But when I was District 3 Councilman, we made sure that we set money aside, um, working with the two different administrations, that we put money into that because it was, it was near and dear to me because obviously it's part of the district. It's right there, actually not too far from my neighborhood. Those are the things that have been important, and I've reached out to the Hispanic community by doing things like that, making sure we had the funding, making sure we looked for other locations to go to or for expansion. Numerous things happened along the way. We weren't able to move it at that time, but the funding was there in place. And I, I believe that's what's important, that you show the different communities. You know, too often we hear North Kenner and South Kenner. We need to start referring to it as just Kenner, the northern region, the southern region. Make sure that everyone, and there's a lot of Hispanic businesses on Williams Boulevard, that they realize that there is no barrier. And I think what's important is that they feel more comfortable with code enforcement, they feel more comfortable with any type of enforcement, and we reach out to them through possibly a cultural liaison person. I don't think we have that. I know we don't have that right now. We're getting ready to actually do that in the parish and I'm not going to say Hispanic or just this ethnic group. It's a cultural liaison person. Obviously, the biggest language barrier would be with the Hispanic population because that's our biggest population. So it would cater more toward that growing group right now, but it would be open for all. Um, I believe by the things that I've been out there saying to the Hispanic community, being part of it is why I more than likely had the HISPAX endorsement, which I think is, an, uh, is a great thing to have. I've had in the past numerous times during races, and I think that's why they've reached out to me this time and given me that endorsement. So the things that I want to do is making sure that language barrier is not there, a cultural liaison person, and assist this resource center in any means that we can. Next question is for Councilman Zahn. So uh, many members of the Hispanic community or Latino community uh, report uh, having uh, discomfort or fear and uh, feeling uh, worried that if they go to the police to report being victims of crime or even uh, as a witness to crimes, being um, worried that they may be investigated themselves, their legal status may come up, they may get in, uh, in trouble themselves, just trying to be a good Samaritan and, and identify criminals they saw committing a crime or hurting someone else. Um, under your administration, if you're elected mayor, um, uh, how will you address that? How will you address relations between the police and uh, Hispanics if they're stopped for a speeding ticket, for instance? Well, the police, the police chief in the city of Kenner is elected. So the mayor wants to work with the elected chief 
who will run the police department. But making sure, as mayor and as also as a legislator for the council, I believe the council's job and the administrator's job, the, the CEO of the city, the mayor, is important to make sure that they understand, not the CEO of the city, is to make sure, working with the CEO, is to make sure that they understand that all basic human rights will be protected. And that's what I would do as mayor, to make sure that they understand we're protecting your human rights, but we're gonna work with the chief of police, who is elected, not appointed by the mayor, work with him closely. And I do think we have a great chief of police like we've had in the past. Our two phone ones before that have always been, have done good work with the Hispanic community. I don't believe there's, a, there's an outcry from the Hispanic community with the Kenner police. I don't know about other areas, but I'm worried about Kenner police. Um, working with that elected chief and making sure all the basic human rights are protected would be my goal as mayor. Okay. Councilwoman uh, DeFrancis, same question for you. Absolutely. Uh, we'd like to repeat their question. No, for I you. understand it totally. Okay. I actually have a very great relationship with the Kenner Police Department and the police chief, both with the former police chief Caraway as, as well as with Chief Glazer. And our police department really reaches out to every ethnic group in our community. I will tell you, one of our police officers, and I'm going to name her, uh, Officer Guggenheim, it uh, doesn't sound like Hispanic name, it's not, but she speaks Spanish fluently. And we have other members of the police department who speak Spanish fluently. But in addition to that, what's really important is our police department has sent officers to the Hispanic Resource Center to learn Spanish because they want to reach out to the Hispanic community and make them feel comfortable. And Councilman Zahn is absolutely correct. We have to look out for everyone's human rights, and we have to make people feel comfortable with our police department. What's interesting is I recently spoke to someone from Orleans Parish, and he heard me speaking to someone, and he asked the question, how does your police department actually reach out to these uh, to, uh, members of the community and make them feel comfortable? Because we have a, real pro a very real problem in Orleans Parish, and I mentioned how we have the police patrols on bicycle, how we reach out at the school, under, in the school system, and many other ways in which the police department does that. And that makes our children comfortable with the police and our adults comfortable with the police by going to these functions throughout the city. Okay, next question for Councilwoman uh, DeFrancis. Do you have any specific um, plans uh, to add to some of the things that you've already described that are being done? to uh, involve uh, the Latin community or uh, reach out to the Latin community or to involve in your administration um, liaisons or members of your staff or cabinet members that will help promote and grow relationships and uh, a healthy interaction with the Hispanic community. Well, let me just point out something that I did that I thought was important when I took office in 2006. My assistant speaks Spanish fluently. She is from Honduras. I have the only, only assistant who speaks Spanish fluently or speaks Spanish at all on the third floor. So when people come to the council office, whether it's to speak to, my, to me and my, someone in my office or any of the other offices, we have someone upstairs on the third floor who can help translate and can, and can help them. We also have to have more people on the second floor if I, uh, in the mayoral office that can actually reach out to the Hispanic community and speak to them when they want to come see the mayor or have a problem that they need to speak to someone in the mayor's office. And we don't really have that right now. We did for a short period of time, but that's missing right now. And that's one of the things I will definitely work uh, to bring more Hispanic-speaking people that, ha that you know, are fluent in Spanish as well as in English onto the second floor to reach out to the Hispanic community and make them feel comfortable. And that should be throughout all of our you know, all of our different offices, not just on the mayoral uh, floor, not just on the council floor, but even with our, some of our directors. We need to make sure that we realize we have one big city with so many different groups, and we need to reach out to all those groups. Councilman Zahn, same question for you. Would you like me to repeat it? No, I, I think the cultural liaison position, obviously, I, I kind of answered that before, would be very um, important uh, in the mayor, on the mayor's floor. Also working with every department, um, and I'll clear that up. It's not just, I mean, obviously someone who reports to the, to the mayor's office and the mayor, but obviously working with every department, undoing that language barrier. And I think that's what the our biggest fight, with, right, our biggest issue we have right now is to address it like that. Also in Lafayette Park, with recreation, Lafayette Park, we've reached out to the Hispanic community because I know, you know soccer is a very big part of that. That might be something we have to look at in the future with recreation. I don't know how much we offer with recreation. Talking about going from the liaison to recreation, um, I think we need to maybe look at that. We have some 
other properties in the city of Kenner. A um, lot of properties out there that we, you know, we've been approached as I'm not on a campaign trail, tennis courts, soccer fields, more, um, more like what we're doing with um, Coconut Beach, maybe through um, independent business that wants to do a cooperative agreement with the city or through the city itself. Probably through a CEA is the best way to do it because of finances, but I think that's the types of things we need to reach out to and reach out to the Hispanic businesses to see if they want to be part of what's going on in the city of Kenna because I don't think that's always the feeling of those businesses up and down on Williams Boulevard. Okay, now we're at the final uh, question. It's not really a question, it's an opportunity for each of you to um, uh, get in your final word. So, um, uh, last one, and as it goes back and forth, one minute each, uh, this is your opportunity to tell us uh, why anyone should vote for you, in particular Hispanics uh, who are getting to know you uh, through this uh, media blitz. Well, like I said in the beginning, we're going through a lot of great vision and energy right now in the city of Kenner. We're in a perfect position with Lake Town, how it's growing. Uh, the Hispanic community, along with all of our residents, use Lake Town a good bit. That is the future of where we can actually build some things. And we need to attract, you know, we have a Hispanic community. We need to attract all families back to the city of Kenner. The more we work together, and there's no barrier, and that's, I think that's where the cultural liaison person comes into play, there's no barrier with any of our groups in the city of Kenner are important. Because if we can build Lake Town and we can improve Rivertown with Main Street USA and have all these things going on, improve, work with the school board. It's not the mayor's job to go in and tell the school board what to do, but work with the school board and bring younger families into the city of Kenner while we're taking care of our senior citizens across the board, I think is extremely important right now. The Hispanics fall into that. Every ethnic group falls into that. Let's all work together. A lot of Hispanics are in Lake Town, like I said before, on weekends, in the evenings. We want to do a lot out there, a boardwalk. These are the things, as a parish councilman, I, annex, I gave that property, let the Kenna annex that property back. We did that. As a city councilman, we changed the law to make that from a recreation standpoint to a to business, everyone will be able to enjoy that, and that's what I think the, the groups would, would, would enjoy. Mr. Frances, one minute. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you for having us and allowing us to address the Hispanic community and the rest of the community as well. As a teacher for 35 years, I gave my life to the children of Jefferson Parish and, and made sure that I improved their, the, their lot in life by giving them the education that was I felt was so important. Um, I've been very, very active in the community with the uh, Jefferson Council of Aging to the Kenner Senior Citizen Center. Uh, but there's a lot more to it. We have to involve every part of this city and work so we bring everyone together. I was the first to say from the river to the lake, from the lake to the river, we need to have one city and not be a divided city. And with your permission, I'd like to address the Hispanic community and just say a few words. Yeah. With your permission. Half a minute left. Uh, thank you. My name is Maria de Frances, I'm the Council of General for the city of Kenner. I feel proud to be never part of this establishment. I want to give a voice to the people of Kenner, not to the chief of politics. Uh, Fui maestra por 30 años de la parroquia de Jefferson y cinco años como administradora. Sería un alcalde de tiempo completo y uh, ahora es más, más importante haber un alcalde de tiempo completo. Thank you for allowing us to be here. And you wanted our number, minus 77, and Councilman's on. 80. All right, 80. Thank you both for being here. That's all the time we have for our election special. I want to once again thank all our guests for being so gracious with their time and to thank our partners at Totodo Un Poco for helping make this program happen. This is the most wide-reaching program we have ever dedicated largely to Hispanic issues in Louisiana because we're able to reach people not only through TV but online on Facebook and YouTube and podcasts. So please go online to GoVoteLA.com and you can watch all the interviews we've done with the candidates, including bonus interviews with the candidates for Louisiana Supreme Court. You'll also find links to get important election information, including where and when to vote. Thanks so much for joining us and helping make this historic program happen. Thank you.